I'm Dr. Amy Imms, a medical doctor and founder of The Burnout Project. And my main medical background was in emergency medicine and ge then general practice. And then for the last seven years, I've just been working in burnout. So helping individuals and workplaces look at what we can do in terms of preventing and managing burnout. I experienced burnout and that was what prompted the development of The Burnout Project. And for me, it was similar to the story that I see so often that it's all these different factors that it's not just work. So I was working as a GP, I was a breadwinner for my family, but I also had four young children who were four and under. I was trying to study for my exams, but my kids woke up at five and went to bed at 10. So I was trying to somehow fit in study on top of work and amongst all of that. I had health challenges. I was supporting family members with health challenges. You know what it's like. There's so many different things that are going on and any one or two or three or maybe five of those things might have been manageable but it's when they all just happen to come at the same time and it creeps up so often we don't recognize it we make excuses for it oh if I can just get through this period if I can just get through the exam once that kid starts sleeping through the night things will get better and the problem is that doesn't really happen that by the time one thing's resolved another stress has come up and so we never get to that point that we think we're going to get to and so that's what happened to me and it was really not until I felt like I had really reached rock bottom and I started feeling like I was failing everywhere in every area of my life and started wondering, would everybody be better off without me? And those kinds of thought processes are often that trigger that makes us realize this is not just a bit of stress and this is not just going to go away on its own and I really need to, to talk to somebody about it. Identifying burnout can be a little bit complex um, because we don't have any brilliant tools that will just tell us yes I am burnt out or no I'm not and partly that's because what I mentioned before where we have that significant overlap of symptoms with other things uh, however there are things so there's a burnout quiz on my website for example which will take you through 30 things that we often recognize with burnout and so it's that process of reflection of how is my life going right now what impact is those stresses that I'm experiencing having on my life that's affecting me different to normal. So we'll have this different baseline that we're coming from. So we're looking at, is this different from normal? Is this persisting? Does this seem to be linked quite strongly to a specific role? So usually that's going to be our work, but as I say, it could be other roles as well, like volunteering or, or studying. And when we have that strong link from those symptoms to one of our specific roles, then that's going to really increase the chances that what we're talking about here is burnout. The other thing we might see compared to say something like depression is with burnout, we might see that variability with that role. So if we are working and we have all of these symptoms there, we're exhausted, we're depleted, we have no emotional energy, but then we get three, four weeks annual leave and all that picks up and we can engage in life and we almost feel back to our normal selves then that's a really good sign that that's probably a workplace related burnout as opposed to a depression where we would expect that to persist all the time. None of those things are hard and fast and we see variations in that. But really, from a personal level for people listening, my encouragement would be just to have a process of sitting down and thinking about how is life going right now? How was I experiencing it previously in a period of my life where I feel like that's what I would call normal for me, whether that's six weeks ago or 10 years ago, because we might have been burnt out for decades by the time we recognize it. Um, and, and is that having a significant impact? Is it stopping me from living life the way that I want to, from working the way that I want to or not? So the first thing you should do is to tell somebody. It's I often ask groups of people, have you told somebody? And sometimes there are a lot of people who have not told anybody. And to be experiencing possibly the hardest thing in your life that you've experienced and not tell anybody is extremely isolating. So to find somebody who you feel safe with, whether that's a friend or a family member or a professional, somebody at work that you feel you can disclose that to. The second step to then is seek some sort of professional support. So as I mentioned, seeing a GP or a family physician is often a good first step for that, for touching base, making sure that this is actually correct, that we're dealing with burnout and that there's not anything else going on that we need to do uh, and seeing do we need to take leave from work immediately or not. Uh, and then my encouragement is to start super small. So if we start thinking, what are all the things that we can do? And people have often got this big, long mental list themselves of, well, I could be doing yoga and I could be meditating and I could be going for a walk and I probably should be eating better and I probably should actually go out and see my friends, even though I don't feel like it. They've often, you know, we we see the internet, we get 
filter um, quotes coming through our Instagram feed every day. Like we know what kinds of things might be helpful, but that doesn't help us to actually do that. And it can often feel overwhelming in itself. So I always encourage people to bring it right back. We don't need to do a million things. We don't need to find an extra three hours every day to do things. We need to choose one thing that is likely to have a big impact for us and that's where some guidance from somebody else can help us with selecting that thing so that it's most likely to be really helpful but if we can start off with one thing that is super achievable and manageable within your life and the amount of time and energy and whatever resources you need to do that and do that consistently then that's that first step and then we can build on that we don't want to do okay we'll do this for three days but then we can't do that anymore because everybody got sick and I don't have time anymore. Maybe I'll go over here and try this and that lasts for two months, but then that fizzles out as well. And then we try this. Then we get to the end of the year and we've done lots of things, but we haven't really got anywhere often. So start super small and try to be patient with that. And again, that's where it comes back to making sure we've actually assessed the severity of this. Because obviously if somebody has really severe burnout to go, well, let's start one thing and be patient with that and let's see how it goes for a few months is not the right approach. We need to recognize that sometimes we do need to take much more drastic action than that. And stress is something that we all experience all the time. You know, that's a natural part of life, isn't it? That when stressors come up, we respond with a, a stress response. And that is a helpful thing often. If we are in a meeting and we have an, a helpful amount of stress there, then that might help us to speak better, to perform better, communicate better, recall better, all those things that we need to do. Um, in that situation. So stress in itself isn't a bad thing. It's that normal physiological response. However, when we are experiencing stress in a positive way, in a helpful way, then we also have those periods of time where we can recover from that and not be experiencing stress. Whereas what we're seeing a lot of the time these days is that people don't get that chance to recover, that they go from persistent stress at work all day long with lots of deadlines and difficult communication and everything that's going on there. Then they rush straight home to kids or family life or other obligations that they've got. And then they head to bed. And although they might have a period of time in the evening where they technically don't have any stressful stimuli at that point in time, our brain is still thinking about those things. So our brain is trying to help us with that. It thinks, great, if I think about this, I'm going to be able to find solutions. But often we're not finding solutions. We're just ruminating over those things or worrying about things. And there's no productive outcome there, except that it's making that period of time another period of stress. And then we eventually get to sleep. So it's, it's really on all day. And these aren't just thoughts and feelings that we're talking about. We get that physiological stress response with all of that. So we get release of hormones. We get alteration of heart rates and blood pressures and uh, shifts in our immune system and all of those things that come along with that. So when we're getting that persistent stress over time, without that chance for recovery, then that's where we start to see burnout. And we talk about some key features that we start to see when that's transitioning to burnout. So things like a persistent fatigue and lack of energy and emotional withdrawal. So we get um, we can get a bit cynical, loss of empathy, socially isolating. And then often we start to feel like our job's being impacted as well. So we start to wonder, what am I doing here? I'm not very good at this. I'm actually achieving anything. And we may not be performing as well as usual because we're tired and unmotivated and not concentrating and all of those things that we talked about. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's looking at, is this an, is this a stress response, which is happening intermittently? And I feel like I can recover in between, or is this persisting? And I'm starting to see more of those ongoing changes over a period of you know, four, six weeks or longer. So when I use that word self-care, I use it in the very broader sense of anything that you can do, then it's going to benefit your well-being and help you to recover from burnout. So I've had clients who their biggest self-care practice is actually changing something structural at work. So for example, sticking to time boundaries with their clients that if they've booked 15 minutes or half an hour that we stick to that and we build that expectation and that for them might make far bigger difference 
than if they meditate and run and eat well and those other things that they could be doing. Uh, I've got other people who have had huge benefit from changing their internal response to things. So what might happen is there something stressful happens or they're running late and that in itself may not be a massive issue, but it's then what goes on in here that that stress response and those thought processes that come up from that then make them more anxious, more likely to make mistakes. They procrastinate all those flow on effects. And so for some people, it's really drilling down on those internal cognitive processes and addressing that and shifting that or shifting that perfectionism. You know, when we see people who might stay back at work three or four hours because things aren't exactly right, if we can shift that, then that's going to have a huge impact. Uh, but then there are also those things that we might more traditionally think of as self-care. And so I have a, a lot of my clients will have some sort of a practice of addressing those thoughts through a mindfulness-like type approach. Um, I'm not a fan of a lot of formal mindfulness as we might traditionally think of it, but it can be a super helpful skill to draw into things and address all sorts of challenges that we experience through life. And one of the big reasons I do that is because we need that chance to switch off. So often people, as I was mentioning before, they go home from work, but they're still thinking about work. They can't engage in those other things they want to do. They don't really get that break. So developing skills and strategies so that we can actually get that mental break and engage in those things that we want to enjoy and spend time doing, I think is vital because then we get that, we get the joy back in our life. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in work and errands and parenting and just all those things that we need to do. And it's so often that I ask people, what do you do for fun? And they look at me like, I, I don't know what I do for fun. I've got to go back 20 years ago now to remember what I did for fun. And and that's no way to live, you know, um, to rediscover those things and to get to a point where we have that time and energy to feel like we can actually relax and enjoy and make space for those things in some way. In terms of that term, the burnout epidemic, I think that's probably alluding to the fact that we are seeing it increasing, that burnout has been around for a very long time. We go back into history and it's certainly not a new phenomenon, although it was first described in about the 1970s. Uh, we've seen it only increase since then and particularly the data since the pandemic saw a, a big rise in burnout and there was a hope that that might settle a little bit as the effects of the pandemic or the restrictions and concern uh, sort of lessen. But in fact, what we're seeing is the opposite. So we're seeing even more burnout come up because there are those ongoing persisting effects uh, all around the world. We do need to really support individuals. We need to create safe spaces for them to speak up and have these conversations and facilitate access to the support that they need to recover. But we also need to be looking at it from a preventative perspective, from a system perspective. What are these bigger issues that are playing into this and how can we address that? How can we have robust policies and training so that our workplaces and organisations can help to facilitate that and, and reduce that? From an individual perspective, what I really want people to know is that Burnout is this consequence of the age that we find ourselves in and the circumstances that you're in and that it doesn't reflect a personal level of res resilience. And if you're burnt out, it's not that sign of failure or personal inadequacy and that there is hope for that, that if we get that right support, we can recover, we can rediscover that joy in life and feel like the way that we're living life is sustainable again.